Hi, uh, I'm Joe Casavar. I am the Joe of Puzzles by Joe, and welcome to the Knob Theory of Puzzles Variations. Um, I shipped my first clutter on in February of 2011, and shipped my seventh version of the game. And it's not a version of the game; it's actually a sequel. It's another game. Um, the first game doesn't change. The first game's out there, still making me money. Actually, uh, the seventh game shipped uh, just last month. Uh, my email address is joecasvi at aol.com, and I am going to put this up on my website. Um, okay, so creating the games itself, uh, even creating the first game or any game, is actually a marathon. However, this lecture is going to be a sprint. Uh, i got a lot of slides, a lot of things to go through. Hopefully, I'll have even time for questions at the end, but I'm going to try to move pretty quickly. Okay? Um, but I want to start with a trivia question. I want, um, does anybody happen to know who is the first person to think of the 4x4x4 four by four by four variant of the 3 by 3 by 3 Rubik's Cube? And I don't mean make it. I mean the first person in the world that actually thought of the idea. Ever, it's a woman. You've never, okay, anyways, her, uh, I'll tell you her name in a second. I'm going to do one more slide first. Uh, the name of this, um, the knob theory comes from uh, Douglas, Douglas Hofstetter, who wrote a very famous book called Gudel Escher Bach. And he also wrote the um, games column for Scientific American after um, Martin Gardner uh, retired from doing that. And um, he's, he's big into AI and stuff. And the knob theory is really basically that everything, everything in life, in fact, he thinks intelligence is seeing the knobs. So this podium uh, could have been made of metal. It could be taller. It could be wider. It could have a different sign on the front. And seeing all those little variations in your mind is really what intelligence is all about. That's why we do analogies um, for IQ tests and stuff. Um, anyways, but, uh, but I want to point out that now that you know the knobs is the genius is not twiddling those knobs. Anybody can go from a three to a four um, you know, cube and a three by three. Oh, let's think of a two by two. Anybody can do that. Um, it's actually being able to spot the harder knobs and doing something more interesting with them, okay? Uh, my qualifications, I've done um, seven clutter games and counting, and each game is really very, very different, and you're going to see that today. Uh, my qualification, too, is uh, why you should listen to me at all, is those games have made over $2 million in sales, um, and I get to keep about a third of it. Uh, it sounds impressive, but really that's seven years. It's not that much money. I'm doing okay. I'm doing better than if I worked for somebody else, but I'm not getting rich or anything. So uh, two takeaways for this talk. The first one is uh, anybody who's a game developer or whatever should look at this stuff and go, wow, I could do that. Okay. You really can. It's not the main idea. The main mechanic was so simple. And then it's just time and effort to do the variations and stuff. And that's what this talk is about. Um, and the last, the second takeaway is uh, just a quote that I got from Hofstetter from uh, George Bernard Shaw from one of, I believe, his plays. And it's the quote, it says, you see things and say why, but I dream of things that never were and say why not. Okay, so moving on. Oh, and to answer the trivia question, the lady's name was Eve Rybody. And I want you to remember that because I'm going to ask it about it at the end. Her name is Eve Rybody. Okay. Okay. Part of the joy of doing this talk is uh, they like the idea that I could work in my, my cubes. And this is 35 of my 80, 89 plus cubes I have at home. I think I stopped counting at about 89 and searching for places where, oh, I forgot that one. That's over in the corner, you know, kind of a thing. Um, I'm going to show these five at a time for each one of the games, basically, because they represent different levels of variations to me. Um, the first one is this very simple one. So the one in the middle is an actual Rubik's Cube. Um, it's called a speed cube. It's not quite the original cube, but um, for all intents and purposes, it really is. I actually don't own an original cube anymore because the stickers get old. And I, Actually, I probably have it in a box somewhere, but it's unusable. Uh, the one, this is a really poor picture. I apologize for that. But the one in the upper left is a... Um, it's actually, it, they call it a business exec, I think it's called the executive cube. And I'm not going to tell you the names of all the cubes because I don't know them. But it's all silver black, it's all shades of black and white. 
So it's really a pain to do, but it's this impressive cube because of that. So, and they sold it as an executive model. Um, the one in the upper right is a true different coloring of the cube that makes things interesting where you have to care about where that center is uh, and how it's rotated. The one in the lower left is really the cube with just pieces shaped slightly differently. It's not, it's not any different than the regular cube. And the other one is actually three layers. It's kind of an interesting coloring because you don't have to worry about uh, flipping or rotations, but it, it's a fun little cube that I think I got way back in like 82 or 83, right after the cube came out. So these are all simple variations. Okay, this is my first clutter game and I think, is this the video? Yeah, this is the video. So this is my promo for the first game. Very simple, you pick off two things that match. And this one you match to the boxes down, down there. Now you're matching as they come along the treadmill. Um, the objects are split in two. The, this is a triple match. Uh, next up is black and white versus the colored version. And this was all in the first game, these variations. These are all pretty simple variations. And then, because of the way I did things at the time, there were extra mini games that broke up the monotony of just playing the clutter games. But it turns out nobody cared about these games over time. I finally gave up doing them. but. They're in here because they're in the promo. They're not in the rest of the lecture. Um, and that's it. This is the only mini game that survived because it's picture oriented and people liked it. So that's that. And this is that really ugly opening screen I created for this. Um, I wanted to, I needed to prove I could do a game. I, I couldn't spend a lot of art. All I cared about was, you know, my time and investment in it. And um, so whenever possible, I used photorealistic art. I had a bunch of photorealistic objects that were from a company called uh, Hermeta, I think, or something like that. Anyways, I actually wrote them and made sure because it was before digital. If they came out today, this would have cost me too much because I would have had to pay for actually using them for everybody who downloaded. Uh, like I have to do with the music, I get a royalty free thing. But nowadays, if you try to get a royalty free image, just one image can cost you, you know, 50 bucks. Um, if you're using it, you, you can use it on your website for five, but if you put it in a game or something, it might cost you 50 bucks for each one, which would be prohibitive. Um, okay. So the first one was, again, was just the basic, you, you pull two things off that match. Uh, and it doesn't matter if they're buried or not. You see the two radio, the red radios, boom, you can click on them and remove them. Um, for this first game, all I cared about was giving them, again, variations and even variations within the variations. So the three main variations I came up with was just the straight match, the pop-up boxes, and the treadmill. And the straight match I used much more often and then broke it up. I'd, I'd do two of those, one of the pop-up, another one of the straight, um, back to the treadmill, and then um, a special puzzle before they got this sort of this story thing. But um, all I cared about was trying to give them something that felt fun, but also kept breaking up in different things. And I wanted, the nice thing about the pop-up boxes and the treadmill, they work with any other combination I do. So when I split them in half, those still work. If I do a match three, they still work, actually. If they do black and white, they can still work. So it's a nice one because it can work with everything. And that's some of the variations I come up, up with that's true, and some variations you come up with limit. They don't, they don't play well with others. Um, but most of the ones that are important, or the big ones, are the ones that actually play well with everybody. So, Because then you can mix and match, and really, as the games get deeper, you'll see that I did that. Um, so that one's, I think, the treadmill. There's the split in half. There's the match three, and um, there's the black and white. This was a nice one. I like to, um, one of my theories of game design um, is if a puzzle looks really hard, I want it to be easier than it looks. And if a puzzle looks really easy, I want it to be harder than it looks. And this one really fried their brains and I loved it because of it. And every object on there has an alpha of 128, which means you can see through it. And you can't tell the difference between this and this. You sort of can, but you really can't. And Therefore, if they click on a specific area, they may or may not get the object they think. But there's no penalty for that, and um, you know, 
But this one scared him, and this one, uh, this one set the tone that at least in each game, I think there's one puzzle type that gets the, I guess, the err effect from them, which is what I'm actually going for. And I now communicate enough with my people that really love the game that, you know, I know, I, when I say things like that, it's because I've heard it from them. I'm not just guessing. I don't have metrics in the game, but I do have enough feedback over the years. This is a big and small variation where you have too big and too small of each object like that. Uh, the little box, the, the very, it's, it's a wood box, but it's got some red on it. You see it, the big one right in the middle? Well, there's actually, you can see the two big ones, you can see the two small ones. You can't click the two small ones to match them. You have to find a big and a small for each one. Um, another variation I did was I, one of the things is once you set all the rules, then you try to break them one at a time. Well, in all the other game, in all the other levels, all your matches sit on top and there's background pieces that don't match anything, okay? So at the very end, you end up with two things you're trying to find in a sea of other stuff, but they're never covered because it's always on top versus behind. This broke that rule. This was called small on top, but I made the pieces on top smaller so you could see them. And I added a feature that when you when you unclick something, it'll move away. And that's the only level that'll do that on. And, and that's, what it, that's what happens with the variations. You create a variation, you start playing with it, and then you really go into problem solving mode of how to make it funner and how to make it you know, not frustrating at least. Okay, so that was Clutter 1. So Clutter 2, Clutter 1 did just well enough, I decided to do the sequel. And this isn't the money talk, so I'm not gonna talk about all that, okay. But for Clutter 2, I said I can't give them the same old game, and what's the big thing I'm going to give them to do in Clutter 2? And I came up with a couple things, and but before that, this is the 2x2 two two Rubik's. And you can see that's Homer Simpson in the middle, and he is in fact a 2x2x2 two by two by two Rubik's Cube. And then you have 2x2s two that are connected with each other, there's a Braille version of a 2x2, two two. and then there's a 3x3x2, three three which just felt like it belonged there. Okay, so. I'm doing a sequel, I don't want to give them the same old thing. I've been doing games now for 20 plus years. And there's many things that have bothered me over the years that I hear. Like one of, the, one of my favorites is it's hard to find the fun. I hear that from really weak game designers. Uh, game designers that are so bad. There's one game designer, I won't say names or anything, he was so bad I finally started referring to him as a game describer. <laughs> because he was not really a designer, he just described. And he only gave two levels of feedback. Too wonky, not wonky enough. Just, just drove me nuts. And we will, some other time I may talk about him, but I still have to hide his name because it's you know just wouldn't be good. Anyways, what I decided at the time, he was one of these people who say, "Oh, it's hard to find the fun." And I, I finally went, "Yeah, but you know what? It's pretty easy to spot the not fun and get the hell away from it." Okay, and I think that's what I do. Is whenever I do something annoying, it may last for a little while, but the more I test, I go, "No, I'm not going to put him through this." Okay. The other thing I look for for a variation, at least for a major one for a second game, is does it feel different? I want, I don't want a variation to just be, oh, it was red, now it's blue, now it's green. It has to, there has to be something that feels different. Um, and I've already mentioned, but can the variation play well with other variations? Um, and lastly, revisiting old variations and finding what I call minor variations on those variations. Okay. So the first one I came up with, I decided this game was gonna be at least a third to a half of the time is gonna be about dragging. And the first time I played it, it's not fun. It's, it's, it's not fun enough. But if you give them just enough, uh, this is showing the pop-up boxes was just trying to get them used to it. So they drag, 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 and they're looking for those six. So it's not too bad. And there was only, you can see, there's only 14 matches here, right? So it, I think it started with 15 for this, this puzzle. But then I gave him one that's just the, the pile in the middle. And I gave him just enough objects that don't match that's a little bit more than spread out. So either you overlap or you're in trouble. And towards the end, there's just enough time that you're going to miss a couple of your matches too. So at the end, you drag everything out and you got to, I still got two matches. And now you're looking at the whole board trying to find it. And there's actually... Very fun. And I still mixed in the old puzzles, old variations, etc. 
Um, this one, can anybody tell me, um, can anybody see a match here? Shout it out if you see one. See the two power, uh, the two flower pots? See the two connectors? Do you see them? Okay. This is a variation called close counts that I introduced for this, where I had alternates for some of the pieces. And they no longer have exact matches, which makes the game much different. You can't just defocus your, you can't just look at patterns. You have to really sort of look at the object. Um, and the last thing I started doing, especially, these are, these are things called stockpile challenges. And this is the first one I gave them. This one, oh man, this is, this I know scared them right off the bat. But it's really not too, too bad. I mean, if you look right off, there's the, there's the upside down guy to the right, top right. You can see him matching right in the middle. You can see the two blue eggs. I mean, it looks scary, but it really, it isn't. And by the way, I have, I have control over how hard any puzzle is, of whether it's really a race where you're just matching or whether you're really looking a lot more. Uh, I control sort of this intermix thing going on that really can determine the puzzle. Plus, all my puzzles rubber band, which is a secret I'll probably never tell my customers, but they basically rubber band to your skill level with the timing. That uh, treadmill at the bottom looks like it goes one per second as that lap counter goes down. It's really one from anywhere from 0 0.750 to 1.25 based on your skill level. And as you win and lose levels and how many matches you have left, it rubber bands this. It also does one other thing. It takes the field you're playing on and depending on your skill level, if, you're, if, you've, if your skill level is low, it'll do this to the level, just slightly. And if your skill level is better, it'll do this to you. And just that, that is just enough to affect the hardness of a level. And then I let my algorithms just work. I trust them. Um, okay, so that was two. And again, it still worked in all the other stuff. So after, after two... Um, my wife wanted me to keep putting in, you know, gorgeous pictures as rewards and all this stuff. And um, I finally decided I, I needed to get her out of the loop. That the second one did well as well as the first and bumped additional sales. And I finally, I definitely knew I was doing three now. And I decided to make three a true Joe game. And I made the story a little weirder. I made it, you know, whatever. And I wanted to see how it did. And it actually did better than the first two. I also made, it went from 800 to 600 by 10 to 1024 by 768. Um, and the story became even more meta. So I wanted to spend just this slide telling you about the stories. So the first story uh, had two parts. One part was this Leon Poncelet guy who um, ran a Declutter for Life seminar and they got tips throughout the game. And the second half of the story was his lineage from Ponce de Leon, where it led up towards the end where Ponce de Leon never found the fountain of youth. He found the ways of decluttering, which made the quality of your life better, not necessarily the length of it. And everybody thought I was Leon. Leon came up for every help message, and everybody thought I was Leon, and people said things like, it's a self-help book masquerading as a game. Some people said, looks like a student project. And, um, and people were really annoyed that, oh, and he's so arrogant, he put himself in the game. But that was Leon. And at the end, he meets Anna, which is my wife, and um, it explains sort of why Brazil's in the game and so forth. So I mixed, and there was stuff from my real life. And there was a lot of, in the Leon Poncelet story, there's a lot from my own life that I put in because I didn't care. And, you know, I always like to do that. If I can put a number in the game, it's going to be my birthday. You know, it's just the way I am. Um, so the third game, I decided to teach, I wanted to really prove, I wanted my customers to start thinking about would they rather play a boring, beautiful game or an ugly, addictive game, fun game. And I knew I was biasing the answer, but I did this thing called The Void, and we're not going to get into that, but The Void was about, what The Void was a, was a game designer, basically. And it's, I give them five answers to who The Void is, and it was very much personal, very much Joe and so forth. And it did better. Uh, for the fourth game, there was really no story. I wanted to do no story, but I also focused, it was called Minigame Madness Tour. It was called Clutter 4 Minigame Madness Tour, and it focused on the minigames, and that's when I learned 
nobody cares about the minigames. And it didn't do as well. It didn't do horrible, but it didn't do as well. And I finally, I used to say, I used to say as a game designer that, um, that it was a club that I use, I use clutter to support my minigame habit. That I, creating mini games is what I really wanted to do, but I used Clutter just to do that. But then I got more mercenary towards the end. I went, no, I want to please my customers. I want to give them, you know, what matters. So I only kept two mini games that are both content driven um, to keep going with. And one was that sliders thing you saw, and that can work on any picture. And another one was a quote box puzzle that I can just give them more paragraphs in the next game, so I don't have to recreate it each time. And I can focus more on Clutter variations, which is really what they wanted. Um, number five, after four, you know, I went even further into the, the meta stuff and the story for five, I kid you not, is exactly what it says. Why am I doing a clutter five and will there be a clutter six? I wanted to scare them. I wanted them to think this was the last clutter game. And, uh, because really after I put out a clutter game, it's within a month I hear from somebody who's been playing it for two, three, four weeks and go, when, when you, when's the next one? And there, there are people that play my clutter games an hour a day, every day since they've started playing them. They, it's meditative. There's, it's tranquil for some people. It's, you know, I don't know what to tell you. Uh, five did so well. For six, I hired two type A people that found me to do the story and art for five. And I coached them a little bit. And I became a fictional character in, in six. In six was about Leon's granddaughter. And uh, I became the father... I was sort of represented the father, but really I became fictional because in it, she, they explained that Leon, <laughs> so Leon, I'm sorry, Leon hated the re negative reviews from game one and two so much he created Puzzles by Joe and the story about the void, which was all true, dead true. The void story is all true, but they, they're now told it's fictional because he made up Puzzles by Joe to take the heat off of Leon. Uh, and it was really cute because they, it, we ended up making, uh, she made Leon's granddaughter this nice character and uh, who ran away from home to, to do Clutter's esports, which, which was really, it was really fun and it was gorgeous and it's, but it, but the market has shrunk. It did better coming into the top, you know, did better, it did better stats wise, but um, sales wise, not quite as strong. And I'm not sure yet whether it's because all the market went away or because five had some charm that it didn't or whatever. But most people don't like the stories at all. Some very easy to skip with just an unclick of a button. Um, the people that like the story at all complained that it wasn't Joe centric enough. So I went crazy with seven and I finally decided that the story for seven is going to be, how did I become the guy that created the clutter games? And it starts with this little thing about my, I have a bad left eye, and because of that, I wasn't a jock like my brothers. And because of that, there's a clutter game. And really, if there was, if I didn't have a bad left eye, probably wouldn't be a clutter game. And it just goes on from that. With, uh, it's 60 puzzles. I'm 60 this year. Um, I told the story of my life as seen through the person that became the clutter thing. So, And so far, nobody's complained about it. So, good. Okay. Next round of, now we're getting in some interesting variations on the cube. That one in the upper left is called a mirror cube, and it's the Rubik's Cube done instead of color, but by depth. It's in, entirely that color on all sides, but each piece, it's a different depth. And you can actually, I can do it under the table, you know, without looking at it because you can feel it and, and feel the depth. Uh, the one in the lower left is pretty cool. It's, uh, everybody was impressed that, you know, the, the original cube doesn't fall apart because it hangs so close to those centers, right? And this one has no center in any direction. It's awesome. Uh, there's a bandage cube in there. And these, now you're getting into much more sophisticated variations on some themes. Okay. Uh, so three. So the main game mechanic in three was I created the void character and you saw all those, um, I'll put that back up. I put these discs and this was, they're all silhouettes and I, I've been influenced by a show called The Prisoner and Watchmen and this is sort of a cross between the prisoner themes from the 60s and the Watchmen little um, smiley button. And uh, instead of who watches the Watchmen, it's who is the void. And I was just sort of having fun with it. And towards the end, they get a puzzle that's all these pieces that they have to, you know, do. Um, 
anyways, the main thing was this game where I put 10 of those in. They act as blockers. You can't click up. They can't move. And, but the five matches up top, the very top there, as you get one of those matches, all 10 of those get slightly bigger. Then they go back a little bit smaller and two fall off. So by the time you've cleared the top, they're all gone. And it just made the it made it a little more fun. They get an option. They also get an option that they can end the level after they get the top five and so forth. Um, I did a lot more specialty puzzles. This was actually it was a very it was a shorter quest. It was only it was about half as long as most of my other quests, but I gave them more specialty puzzles like this one. Um, this one's one of my favorites because it's all computer keys and Sometimes you can't even tell, you know, what's on the computer because the letter's not showing because the letter only shows, you know, in one corner. So I like that. This one is, uh, the, uh, if you look for the Ace of Clubs quickly, you'll see four of them. And um, two of them are mirror imaged. And the mirror images go with each other. But, the, you know, a mirror, you can't match the Ace of Clubs that's to the left up there, upper with the lower right because it's a mirror image. So. Um, a lot of fun with that. Again, they look at this, they get really scared, but I give them a little more time. And, you know. Okay, so four, I already talked about Minigame Madness. Um, just didn't do as well. I wanted to digress just one minute for um, brainstorming lies. So one of the things I read in Hofstetter's article, and that is at the beginning, so you can actually link to it. Um, he talks about brainstorming, you know, and it being garbage and and it is it's it's one of my beliefs because it leads to death by committee and watering down things etc and and one of the beliefs you get told is oh there's no bad idea and that's bull there's just incredibly bad ideas okay and when you get a group doing you know and watering it all down then you can get really bad ideas that you know go runs with it so um so quickly on these points, outside the box is great for finding solutions for me, but it's not good for seeing the knobs as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I already said the bad ideas, group thinks even worse. One of the things I like about my game, because I've always believed it ahead of time, uh, before, is I want to make a love me or hate me game. If you make a game where most people see and go, oh, that's, that's, yeah, I, yeah, that's a pretty good game. And nobody goes, oh, that sucks. You actually haven't made a good game. What you want is some people going, wow, that sucks. And other people going, oh, that's awesome. Okay, you don't want just that middle set as far as I'm concerned. And I, I did that. That's, that's, that's the main thing. Um, okay, so these are really sophisticated cubes. That one in the lower left, that center can actually be an edge. If you move it just an eighth instead of the full quarter, you can then turn the, it's, it's brutal. It's a lot of fun. Uh, the one in the lower right is a restricted cube. You can each you can only do each side 90 degrees, so you can't do the cubes. Um, the two up top, you can see the latch cube is very cute. On three of the sides, it's got those concentric um, arrows. On three of the other sides, it's got the reverse, the counterclockwise uh, versus clockwise. If you put an arrow that faces an arrow on it, you can no longer move that edge. So it's very restricted. Um, it's amazing that as hard as the Rubik's Cube is, lots of people have spent many, many hours going, how can I make that harder? You know, so, um, okay. So in four, this is, I did a little bit more with this clutter lines thing that had been evolving and I just made it sort of more powerful. I think they, I think they even saw this in earlier versions, but this was the major difference. Because again, the, the, for Clutter 4, it was all about the mini games. And I actually did a bunch of new mini games and I extended some older ones that they seemed to like and so forth. So there really wasn't much clutter in this one. This is Clutter 5. This was my best performing game. I think part of it is the charm of this opening. Uh, people like the cave metaphor. There was, when you hit those birds fly around that exit sign like vultures, that plane drags a banner that tells them they've, they've solved zero of 600 puzzles. And, you know, it, you want to show them somewhere, you know, early on how big things are and usually before the buy decision. And I did that with all my games, but I think this does it even better. And by the way, if they sit on the main menu long enough, the second time the plane comes by, it says stupid things like Anna's Clayhouse, uh, Eat at Joe's, uh, you know, just stupid stuff. And again, and uh, just a note on stupid stuff. So whenever I got an idea that I thought to myself, oh, God, Jim or Bill, you know, my other produ producers wouldn't let me do that. 
I went, okay, it's, it's going in the game. <laughs> you know, I knew it would, be, it would get me more excited as soon as, as soon as I could envision that. And it's not like I actively did it. It just it would pop in my head. I could see Jim going, oh, Joe, you're nuts. And I go, yeah, and I'm doing it. <laughs> um, okay, so five more cubes. These, these are, you know, again, just much more. Um, the seven by seven is just to show. It's really not that different. The Sudoku one's kind of cool. Again, you have to, to solve it, you actually have to have each side have the numbers one through nine on it. So that's a pain. And you can, but it's really not that hard. You actually work that out first, and then you sort of solve it Rubik cubes wise. Uh, the one in the lower left there is this, what they call a cube cube, cube. And it's not that much harder. It's almost like a two by two cube. But the centers, those centers sort of move. They really move because they're not attached to anything. And that kind of fries you. You don't have, you have to build a new way of thinking to remember where you are on the cube. So learning an operator is a little harder on that cube. And it was fun. It was actually probably the first cube after the regular cube I got that offered me an interesting challenge that was, was fun on some level. You know? so you'll know. You get your cube here. It'll be fun someday. Um, for this one, one of the big things I added was a never ending. I crossed it with Tetris and had a lot of fun with this. So you have four, you have four ground pieces that have matches. So if we look to the right, I think, can anybody see any match? Shout it out if you see it, any match on the right. I do not see any. I should have picked a better slide. But anyways, there are matches over there. There are 50 matches and 50 back pieces that don't match anything. The ones coming down the tube match back pieces. If you make a match that's just in the main playing field, the lowest one on the tube pops out and goes to the background, and then, a, and then another background piece comes in. So because that matches something, that board stays the same all the time, always 50 matches and 50 in behind. But if you just click on that box, for instance, that's right there, it would, even without it one falling, it would go over and make the match. And then another, again, another background piece goes in. A um, question real quick? Um, yeah, what do you got for a match? Uh, lower left. Oh, keyboards. The, no, no, no. Oh. On, on the, 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 the two and a half inch, it's a, like a picture, it's a red yeah. body, and then all the... Oh, yeah, I see it. Sure, the, sure, kitty corner. Lower left, upper right is the red uh, is the red base or red pitcher, yeah, like, uh, and there's the keyboards. Those too, you can see the gray ones. So anyway, so that was kind of you know that's a fun and that's a never ending one, and you can't win the level. You just it's Tetris. It's you finally just lose it, and it speeds up slightly as you play it. Um, I also took the concept that I introduced at two and didn't use it since two, and I made all the pieces have three variations so that I could do close counts whenever I wanted. And in fact, what this game was, this was 100 levels plus bonus puzzles and other stuff, so it was like 150 levels total, but the 100 levels were 25 normal puzzles, 25 close counts, 25 uh, blocker puzzles with those blockers that I showed you, and then 25 close count blockers. Um, and again, it did well. So, um, and in this game, <laughs> I actually put this slide in, which is, this is my favorite, my, my best and worst review of each of the other games. And uh, I'll just read, worst game I ever played, huge fan of HOG games, but this was awful. Who's the void and most of all, who cares? The absolute worst sort of junk pile ever. As opposed to addicting game, addicting. Love the third install. I love it, I love it, I love it. So anyways, I, I enjoyed sharing that with my, my customers. Now we have a game, doesn't even look like a color game, it's so beautiful. Um, this was done by a girl named April uh, Borschelt. Um, and the story inspired me. Because it was eSports, I had to create a level that faked AI and let you play uh, head dead. Oh, here's the, here's the obligatory, this is the last screen of, um, is this the last screen? Might be the next to last. But these cubes are really wild because they start playing with the shapes of the cube and stuff. But that lower right and lower left are really just normal cubes. But the shapes just fry your brain when you try to solve them. The one in the upper right's a gear cube. The one in the middle is a three by three by three, but has nine on each of the, it's like a plus sign. And they're really attached to that corner. So it's really just a cube, but it fries your brain too. 
And there is a couple things it can do. When that three by three is on the side by itself and all the things are filled, there's no empty spaces, you can actually rotate it. So it is, it's not quite always attached to that same piece. It's not quite. Uh, okay, so this was the head-to-head -head thing I, I built and we, we built uh, nine fake internet names and the main character had changed her name. She hated her name, so she changed her name from uh, whatever it was. To Sky U. I can't even remember her real name in the game. Lee. Lee Poncelot. That's what she... Uh, she changed her name to Sky U. And as you play head-to-head, -head, you play... What you have to do is, as the as you find one, the blues light up the... In fact, maybe I put this in. Did I put this in? Oh, no, I didn't. Um, the last video is of my uh, current game, not this one. I almost used this one. But... Um, this was nice because this inspired me to do some new things. I did this thing. I did a thing called Clutter Chaos, where while you're solving it, back um, any pieces with matches and without matches move every three seconds. You know, they just move and while you. It's really distracting, and it's it, you really just have to learn to ignore it. They're they're totally irrelevant, but they just really catch your eye while you're looking for things. I don't know how much time? Okay. Uh, another specialty puzzle. This is this is uh, rotation matters. Um, so you can see many pumpkins that are the same, but if they're not also the same rotation, they won't they won't match. Um, and this is the last game coming up. This is much more Joe centric, much more. Uh, I did this minimalist opening. Um, you can't see the middle too well, but that's actually a Mandelbrot set sort of cropped and then made into a carpet-like thing because math becomes very important to the story of this, this game. Um, those are the last super, super, super difficult cubes and stuff. Um, the big thing I did for this one um, was I finally decided to break my rule that things are behind everything. And what I did was in this one, like as soon as you match those two pumpkins that you see there, it's either two or three, depending on the level and stuff. Other objects will fall off, but they're the top of the back and the back's intermix now. So it's a much, it changes the game from where you just play it quick, 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 looking for those top matches to look, click, look, click. And sometimes you get two or three in a row, but it really, it's more hunting. It, 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 but it, it felt really good and people seem to like it. They have not complained about this. Um, over time, this has evolved, but this is, this is one of the things that separates my games from all the rest. They can jump to any game they want. The quests are those ones that they that up at the top, and until you get to a level in the quest playing it straightforward, you can't jump to it, but uh, you can jump to any puzzle. This also has favorites, and um, like an iPod shuffle, so you can mark any puzzle you're on as a favorite, and then from the main menu, you can hit the start, and you can just do the favorites. You can do just the levels you want. Uh, it's more about giving them more and more control. Um, this is a nice variation after the dragging inside. I said, oh, let's do it outside in. And this became lots of fun, especially with the, with the, um, the interwoven, because as you make, you drag things in the middle, you look, you finally find a match, and two or three pieces, you know, drop off and uh, do this nice little fade. And they seem to really like this one, too, from the feedback. This is another one of those scary ones. It's timed real aggressively, but it's really clutter on steroids. And as they click on these, they, they, they do go to the regular object. You see them fade into the photorealistic object. And, um, but this is you can play really, really quick because it's the essence. I wanted to teach them that the... I wanted to teach them that it's the essence of pattern matching, not... Um, with the exception of close counts... Using words for things doesn't help you too much in Clutter. When you're in close counts, you actually want to start naming things because if not, you sort of miss that you already saw that pattern. Your, your brain just skips over it. It, it does. But this is the opposite. This is, I mean, you can't help but see those two purple guys right at the top and the two, the two the sort of dark green, ugly things. We don't know what, I don't even know what that is. It might be a toaster or something. Um, they hated black and white puzzles over the years. That's the one I get the most complaints about strain. And they get it, they actually have an option that can turn off black and white so that when they get a black and white puzzle, it's not black and white, it's still the colored version, right? So 
this time around, I gave him something old was the very first puzzle, something new was the second puzzle, something borrowed was the pop-up boxes that actually came from a game prior to the original clutter, and I told him that story of where that came from, and I actually put a picture of that game in. And so level four was something blue originally. And turned out when I made them all blue like this tint, it was too dark because blue is just one of the pixels. So I had to go to the two pixel ones. And they actually got the turquoise and I called it something not quite blue. So the turquoise re uh, replaced the, um, the uh, black and white. But then there's these puzzles. This is actually a three match. And what's nice is over time, and I don't tell them ever, but over time they can finally learn that actually all their matches will be one of each color. Like if you look, um, you should be able to see the, the picture, the, the art that's right in the middle there. You can find there's a, there's a reddish or pinkish one to the left and there's a yellowish one down the bottom. Those are all a match. But you can, you can find two of them and then know what the third tint has to be and go looking for it if you want. Don't have to, and again, I don't tell them that. Um, and I added this variation where um, you can take any picture puzzle any picture and turn it into a, a clutter game. And that's what this does. And they seem to really like this one too. They mentioned this is uh, you know, a good one. Okay, so this is, all the, this is all the variations now. And by the way, this picture is in the game because I wanted it, I don't think it's quite by the by decision, but it's close. And I wanted them to know how much it's really in the game after all these years. And these are all the ones I've explained. I haven't really explained all the rest, and some of them don't make great pictures, um, and we won't get into that. So, quickly, um, they used to have one option screen. I broke it into two. I think the best thing I ever did was give them options. Turn off that treadmill, they don't like it. Turn off the timer if they don't like it, you know. And um, someday I may even go back to the first game and give them these options, because I think people would go rebuy it uh, because of that. But now it's, and they, uh, hold on, okay. They can pick their own music over there. They can either go with the music in the quest if they want. They can pick um, styles of music if they like. They can, you know, anything they unclick, they'll never hear again, you know. Okay, um, and that's it. And then this is, contrast this with the Clutter One. So it's a much better looking game at least. Even the objects are cleaner. It's There's the something not quite blue. The sounds are better. That's from the sound, the person who did the story in the sixth game. Um, I used to have the split puzzles be angular, but I kind of like the, this gives a different feel to it too. Um, what's this one? Oh, this is their matching the treadmill, I think, on that one. Yeah, and the treadmill hadn't been seen for three games, so I brought it back a little bit. There's Fuzzy, that hadn't been there since game one. So I brought a lot of back, back stuff. I called, I had a special area in the quest called Blast from the Past, and I would reintroduce puzzles they had seen before, but very, you know, minimally. And if they click on story, this is called The Four Boys, but that had a picture of me and my brothers in the bat in the, this little baseball picture of bad, you know, the bad eye story. But as soon as they unclick the story, it gets replaced by a random puzzle each time. Um, this is another one that scares them that I just had to give them. And now you, you can see the how they they fade right into the the picture. And that's it. And now the trivia question. Do you remember who it was? Who was it? Eve Rybody was the first person to think of the four by four by four. Eve Rybody. Eve Rybody. Everybody. Wow. Okay? Not an original idea. Sorry. <laughs> okay? Um, I had to get, it was in, um, it was in um, Hofstetter's article. And I've read that article three or four times over the years, I believe. I only caught it. <laughs> this last time, so I felt like sharing. <laughs> um, he had another one. Uh, he actually has two of them. Ann Ann Yon or something. And it's if you read, it's anyone. 
you know, but I really, I really have read this, and I could not believe I did not get this until I was like, wait a second. It was, it's like a practical joke on myself. So I wanted to share that. Uh, that's it. I'm done. Any questions? We have at least six minutes and maybe a little more if you want because of the, the we started late. Go ahead. Um, as someone that does puzzle games, is developing puzzle games, mm -hmm. um, how do you think a good that puzzle design might be? I'm, I always sit in a vote block. I'm like, I can't think of anything else. How do you think of new ideas to add to your puzzle design? Um, Well, again, so so go, you should read that knob article a little bit. And he does this article like he does one of these things. He says one of the key, most key, most important words for thinking about intelligence in general is the word almost. And he goes through this thing, for instance, that. Um, um, so I'll do it here. So um, I'm almost talking to you about sports. OK. Um, I'm almost standing up while I'm talking to you, okay? It's all the little variations that aren't what's really happening. And again, this is why that first thing said the genius isn't spotting that. It's, 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 the, it's what's not there, okay? And when you hit roadblocks, for me at least, it's when you focus too much on what's there. And... It took some things to free me. I thought I was done with three, you know, four. And then all of a sudden, you know, the girls did esports. I said, oh, I got to write a head to head. And then I did that and I went, oh, that opened me to start thinking about chaos. Uh, I have four or five variations I, I didn't, I haven't got to yet. Uh, that one where everything's outside in, I want pieces while you're playing to come into the middle and then change their depth. So they start at the bottom, they come into the middle. And they do this. So it's constantly pieces are coming from the background. And I haven't done that yet because it would take a little too long and I had enough for that game. I sort of shut it down. Um, a lot of it uh, is just playing in the environment. Um, you know, I mentioned the game describer. I am really prejudiced against game designers that don't know how to code. And I, it's not so much code. It's that they don't know how to play in the sandbox. They... Because you can do it with paper and pencil, you can do some things. But people that go like this and describe, you know, ugh, you know, I I get my ideas while playing the game, while testing, while whatever. I go, you know, what if I do this? What if I do? And for me, what I have to watch out is I sometimes I sometimes block myself because I go, that's too hard. But luckily, you know, you have a subconscious, and I've been doing this for seven years. And man, sometimes I go and I'm doing something. And I go, wow, I can do that thing I thought of three years ago. It's not that hard. And it just happens. And a lot of it is playing in the sandbox. Um, to me, that's, that's what it is. It's getting familiar with what is there. Um, I would love to go outside of photorealistic objects. I know I could do a 3D game, right? But it's cost prohibitive for me. I mean, and I've seen a variation where people in a 3D environment can look behind objects so you could actually hide this, you know, the coax behind this. Um, I don't know what to tell you other than, you you know, you, whatever you get working, you know, get it working. And then after you're done, keep asking yourself, well, what else can I tweak? What what can I do that's different? And, and the tough part for most program, I think, is moving forward without wrecking what they already have. And literally, I took, as soon as Clutter's done, I put it in a new directory, call it Clutter 2. Clutter 1 still exists, but Clutter 2, I clone it and I start working. So everything I've ever done in the Clutter games is still in that game. There's nothing that ever gets removed. And I've done it, you know, seven yeah. variations, iterations now. Um, questions? Go ahead. So how did you get started on the Hidden Object game? Do you really like those games? No, no. Nope. Uh, so I did a, I did a, uh, I did a game for I Win Call at the at the top of the uh, Casual Boom uh, called Mahjong Quest, and I was actually really happy to do that because I, I one of my favorite games was Solitile, which was my first Shanghai that I played. Style. Yep, Shanghai style, and it was great. And in fact, it was I was so frustrated because sometimes you get to the you get an ABAB at the end, and you can prove that you could have never solved that level. And one of the things I did with my Mahjong is I solved that problem. 
I made it so that there was no, um, not only actually I made it uh, solvable, I also created a variation for my president because every time I gave him a puzzle, he would lose it. And I actually had to create an unlosable Mahjong level without it looking stupid. And I actually pulled that off too, but that's, that's another time. But anyways, I worked for them. And after doing the Mahjong Quest, there was the game Describer. I got stuck on this really horrible game. I kept saying, hey, I've made the company 17 million. He hasn't made the company, for, you know, so forth. And I would pitch games and they would turn them down. And I, I was arrogant enough and young enough and I would go, I would go, pick a genre. I don't care. You know, like, pick a genre and I'll write something that's good enough, you know? And I, anyways, um, there was this game called Azada, and I thought I could do something similar. It was just as Hidden Object had started, and I wanted to do this. It was a game called uh, Diamonds, and it was a murder mystery in a, in a, in a house like Clue, but each room was going to be a different uh, basic game or, or um, mini game. And I, they half greenlit it. They greenlit it, and I was about halfway done when two other projects that they'd spent about half a million on bombed and they decided they were out of the business of trying to create hits in this in the space and we had done sequels so i did uh, mahjong quest 2 mahjong quest 3 and then they sh they were getting ready to shut down the whole thing i actually quit the company right before they shut down all programming but at the time um my wife said you know can you do diamonds on your own and i said no but i can do something close and she's always wanted this gorgeous, she, she lives on HGTV and she loves, you know, she wanted gorgeous houses that had, and you know, we, the first idea was two socks, two socks on the back of a couch that you pick up. And I went, no, but maybe close. <laughs> and I went home and actually did this, did the basic thing that I loved in a weekend. And the only problem with it, it was, it was a little too hard because I didn't do any funkiness with I actually had 50 objects you match, 50 you didn't, and I didn't care what priorities they were in. So there was no back and forth. And I loved it because you'd just find a little piece of something, you know, and I, I could take 20 minutes on a level, but I'd still solve it because I'd really look and I'd find that little piece. But that's not what people want. But anyways, to answer your question, the hidden object market was the biggest thing that I knew I could get seen in. I don't do my own marketing. I go through the distributors. I knew if I did a game that was big enough, complete enough, which means at least four to six hours of gameplay, et cetera, they'll put it on the site. And then if I got enough eyeballs and enough conversion, well, I'd get the eyeballs, but if I got a good conversion rate, I'd do okay. And that's why I picked the hidden object uh, market. Yeah? So you talk about four to six hours of gameplay. You put together a series of mini games within a larger structure. You basically put together an LP's worth of puzzles. Correct, and even and even my mini games are replayable, right. and they have five variations of difficulty and five. They have five variations within them and five levels of difficulty because that's what I do well. And randomness, they are all. I I lend towards you know programmatically you know randomly generated puzzles, and that's what I wanted to do. And then once I found out I had enough of a niche, you know. So like so an album, they're thematically linked, and they play one after another while you play these steps. They're not so much thematically linked, but. The mini games were the mini games used to be just expected in an HOG game. So I did the ones I did things that I sort of wanted to do, but they're not really thematically. The clutter games itself are much more thematically linked. Even my last one is a much, it's a much better thing. And when I do a story element, I try to connect it up when I can. You know. So what so. do you consider enough before you're done? Oh, no, no, no. Again, they've been playing my game. No, no. My games take uh, even even the basic quest. At best, you can go through the basic quest maybe, if you're good, seven minutes times 100. So <laughs> what's 700 minutes divided by 60? Well, yeah. That's the minimum. And again, these are randomly generated. And that's if you win every level and you're not going to probably. Go ahead. So what do you decide? To what? You've got what, what's the me. Okay. Me. Just, just, it's tough. And, and by the way, even the clutter game itself, when I created, I didn't talk about it. I picked clutter because it was deep enough. It was a thing like a match three. It was a thing that I saw, you know, I, I could list six variations, you know, right that first weekend. And I knew I could, I could split them in half and do this. And then 
I mean, I'm surprised I'm up to 32, okay, but I saw that there were at least 10 things, you know, interesting things I could do. And again, most of them mix, mix and match and stuff. And the, the funnest one that I didn't show you is called uh, pick two, leave one. So they got three of everything, but they match two and the third one stays. And that's another one when they click on that third one, it'll actually, uh, they used to have to click and unclick. And then I made it smarter so that when it was a stranded one, it knew it was a stranded one, so it would just move out of the way. So what you can do is you have to play those levels really quick now. You play them quick, quick, quick till you get about two thirds of the matches done. And then you just go to a pile and go like this. And until something doesn't move and you go, oh, where's that? Oh, okay, good, good. And you can, you, you use the, you use, you can use the, it's a meta way to play it, but you use a strategy that's not obvious to everybody, but, you know, that can do to, to play that level fast. Anyway, what was your question? Um, it's probably like more of a statement question. It's just, I love how you said um, you put mini games at props and you might get them, but not any of the game object games, which is funny because I love game object games. I was playing some right. and I always hated the mini games. Those are yeah. the worst. A lot of people do. A lot of people do. You're not alone. <laughs> I'm like, I'm playing the game for the hidden objects. Right. I got the game for the hidden objects. So, well, not for the mini so what I did was I put in the hidden object games, in the mini games, everything you did pretty much earned you a coin, and five coins got you a hint. I was very generous. But even in the game itself, you didn't see it because I removed them. My basic game, when you win the game, you get a picture reveal, you get a quote and two words that go with that quote, and then you get a little text with it to, to help me tell the story and stuff. And those letters are in the puzzle. Uh, in the very first game, they were actually those Scrabble tiles. Um, in the last game, they were these lit tiles and stuff. And you just one-click those to get those away. And there's an option that can lock them down to make the puzzle harder. And there's another option that says, I don't want to see them, but they still see the story. Uh, because people get sick of doing it. When I play and test it, I actually time it with them there. Which, so anybody who removes them gets a little easiness anyways. But again, the rubber banding, no matter what they do, the rubber band's coming for you. No. Uh, <laughs> so, anything else? We're done. Oh, oh, no, oh, no. Oh. <laughs> That's 33 of the ones from the 35, in case anybody wants to see any. And no, do not mix them up. And no, there is one I'll, I'll play with and solve or show you if you want. And I can show you one like, here's, where's the, oh yeah. So the regular cube, these things hold on to the center. But I'm telling you, that's a center. There is nothing there. And this still works. And it adds something interesting to solve. Because when you put it together, there's a parity to all cubes. And when you put this together, you can end up with these two like this. And on the regular cube, that can't happen. But on this cube, it can. And if it does, you have to do something extra to get rid of it. So it's kind of fun. And there's Homer. Woo! Uh oh. So, um, and thanks. Thanks for being here.